Morning to you all. Thanks. Thank you. Oh, I feel loved. Um, uh, open your Bibles, please, to Hebrews chapter 11. We've been working our way through the Hall of Faith, looking at all the different amazing examples of faith and how that plays out in different ways, and kind of trying to learn from that how we can exhibit God-honoring faith in our own lives. So today we're reading verses 20 and 22. Um, of chapter 11, so why don't you read along with me and then we will pray. Hebrews 11, 20 through 22. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob, when dying, blessed each of his sons, each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. And by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. Let's pray. Uh, Lord, we thank you for your holy word. We thank you that uh, you have chosen to re reveal yourself to us through it. Um, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be guiding us and directing our hearts to uh, understand it this morning, that we would um, receive it with faith, that we would believe in it, trust in it, uh, and act upon it. And so uh, please do what only you can do this morning. Work through uh, my feeble efforts, Lord, to uh, encourage the saints of this church to uh, build up this body in love and uh, most of all faith, because we know that without faith it is impossible to please you. So uh, we love you and we look forward to what you'll do during this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, today uh, we're talking about faith for the family. Uh, and the central idea uh, this morning that we'll be drawing out of the text in just a few minutes is this, that, that your faith affects the future of your family or your faith affects your family's future, okay? In 2007, the Barna Poll Group did a survey and found that one in 10, young adults uh, would be described as people who have vibrant faith. One in 10 of our young people, so this group of kids over here, one in 10 of them would be described as having vibrant faith. The other 90% um, do not. And so Dave, uh, George Barna wanted to find out what caused this. What is it that, that uh, causes 10% of young people to have solid faith, and 90% uh, not to fall by the wayside. And so he started examining their families. And do you know what the deciding factor is between a person of vibrant faith and a person of non-vibrant faith is? Anyone have any ideas? It's the parents. The parents. Uh, the Barna found this, that parents who took God's words on life and family at face value and applied those words faithfully and consistently had kids who, guess what, also took God's word at face value and applied it faithfully and consistently. Surprise. So in, in, in other words, the vibrant faith of the children was based on the vibrant faith of the parents. It's that simple, that, that your faith as parents affects your family's future. And that's exactly what I think we find in, in today's text. So let's just look at it again real quick. Uh, we'll read it right now, and then we'll try to piece it together uh, and try to see if we can find a common denominator. So let's see. Uh, again, I'll just read it. Hebrews 11, 20 through 23. By faith, Isaac invoked future blessings on Jacob and Esau. By faith, Jacob then, when dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph, bowing in worship over the head of his staff. And then by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the exodus of the Israelites and gave directions concerning his bones. So what we're going to do right now is we're going to kind of look at the three guys in this story, the, the, the lives, the, the stories um, that, are, that are represented by these three verses, and we're going to try to piece it together, find a common theme or a denominator, and then we'll end our time together by kind of trying to apply some of the things that we draw from the text to you guys, to me, um, as we learn what it means to be a, a family of faith or to have faith on behalf of your family. So... 
Let's talk about Isaac. Um, Hebrews 20 says that by faith, Isaac invokes future blessing. Now, the story comes from Genesis 27. If you want, you can flip there. I'm not going to make us read all of the stories because we don't have that kind of time. Um, but this is the summary of this story. Isaac is the, the old man depicted here. And uh, if you remember, Isaac, from a couple weeks ago, is Abraham's son of promise. Okay, He's the one that Abraham waited for. Well, now... Abraham's long gone. Isaac is now old, he's blind, and he's dying. He's on his deathbed, and he wants to bless his kids before he dies, Jacob and Esau. And so Jacob and Esau come to him, uh, or actually, uh, he, he, he tells Esau, go, go out and get me some meat, and then I'll bless you. But sneaky Jacob, the brother, uh, sneaks in with a furry disguise uh, to, to, to be like his brother with the hair and stuff, and sneaks in, feeds his dad a meal, and then lies to his poor, dying, blind father, and, 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 and tricks his poor, dying, blind father, and, and gets Esau's blessing, which is the blessing of the firstborn son, which is a big deal back then. Okay, so Isaac, uh, Isaac then blesses Jacob unknowingly uh, with, with Esau's blessing. And then Isaac sneaks out. I'm sorry, Jacob sneaks out. And Esau comes in with his meal that he finally caught and finds out that he's been duped. His brother stole his blessing. And he's like, no, Father, bless me too. Can't you bless me like you blessed Isaac? I'm sorry, Jacob. And, and uh, his dad says this. His dad says, no, I can't bless you like I did. I already prayed to God for Jacob, and God will answer that prayer just as I prayed it. And we see this sort of, this faith, this trust that, that the prayer he prayed would be answered in verses 33 and 37. If you do have it open, you can look. If you don't, just listen. Verse 33, Isaac says to Esau, I blessed him. I blessed Jacob already. And indeed, he will be blessed. And then in verse 37, uh, Isaac tells his son Esau, I, I have made him Lord over you. And I have made all of his relatives his servants. And I have sustained him with grain and new wine. What can I possibly do for you now, my son? In, in other words... What I think that Hebrews 11 is referring to, the faith that Isaac had in blessing his kids, I think it's this, that Isaac is absolutely sure that the prayers he prayed on behalf of his children would come to pass, that God would bring it to pass as Isaac prayed it. He was sure of it. You see in those texts that in, in, in Isaac's eyes, the, the blessing had already happened. I have made him Lord over you. I have made his relatives his servants. I have sustained him. In other words, the, the prayer he prayed for Jacob uh, was irrevocable. He had faith that God would answer that prayer no matter what. And that's why I think Hebrews 11 says that Isaac had faith um, because he knew that God would, without a doubt, answer his prayers for his children. So that's, that's Isaac. That's Isaac's faith. Next, we have uh, Jacob. Jacob, it says in the text that uh, Jacob, when dying, blessed Joseph's sons. Joseph is Jacob's son, so Jacob there is blessing his grandchildren. He's praying for his grandchildren. And this story um, that backs the verse in Hebrews is found in Genesis chapter 48. If you want, you can flip there. You don't have to. I'll sum it up like this. Uh, now, Jacob, who was who stole the blessing in the last story. Now, Jacob is old and blind and dying. <laughs> Sounds familiar, right? And he's on his deathbed now. And Joseph, his, his youngest son, wants to come to him before he, he dies and have Jacob bless his, his grandchildren uh, bef you know, before Jacob kicks the bucket, so to speak. And so Jacob brings his two youngest sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, I'm sorry, I'm not sure if they're the youngest sons, but he brings his two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, um, with him to be blessed by Jacob. And so Jacob lays his hands on the two grandchildren. But you know Jacob is a trickster. Uh, 
And so Jacob switches it up. And he has to play one last trick before he dies, you know, something. I don't know. But he switches it. And he puts his right hand on the younger son and his left hand on the older son. And he blesses the younger son with the older son's blessing. Sound familiar? Okay. So, so Joseph's not very thrilled about this. And Joseph's like, what do you, d- Dad, can you please put your right hand on, on the older son? Bless him. Bless him. Um, and and uh, Jacob says this. He says, I'm paraphrasing, but we'll look at the verses. Jacob says, nope. Sorry, it's going to be this way. God will answer my prayers just as I already prayed them. Sounds very familiar to the first father in the first story. And verses 17 through 19 of Genesis 48 read like this. When Joseph saw that his father had laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not this way. Not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn, but your right hand, put your right hand on his head. But his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know. He shall also become a people, and he shall be great. Nevertheless, the younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. So in the first story, we have the father blessing the children, um, and, and he's going to pray, and he prays with faith that God will certainly do it. God will certainly make them into a great nation. And now this other son, Jacob, does the same thing and blesses the children and is certain that God will bring it to pass, that God will bless the kids and, be, and they will become a great nation. And then he takes it even a step further. His faith is even greater than the faith of Isaac because now he says in verse 19 of Genesis 48 that he says, uh, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. And so what's happening there is he says, God is going to answer my prayer for sure. The kids will become a great nation. And God is going to then bring them out of Egypt into the land that he promised to Abraham and Isaac, it is certain, not a shadow of a doubt, it's going to happen. I'm going to die, but it's going to happen. God will come through. So, Isaac had faith, then his son Jacob had faith, and then Joseph. Joseph has faith. Uh, That's what we read in um, Hebrews 11. It says that by faith, Joseph, at the end of his life, made mention of the Exodus. And this story uh, comes... Are you guys still with me? Did you check out? Okay, don't check out, because this is the last one. We're gonna, then it gets, gets pretty interesting, because we're going to try to piece it together here. So this is in uh, Genesis 50, and we can all flip to Genesis 50, because this one's short. We're just going to read two verses. Genesis 50. So now it's Joseph's turn. What is Hebrews 11 talking about, about Joseph? Genesis 50, verses 24 and 25. And they say this, Joseph speaking, I am about to die. Again, the deathbed thing. But God, even though I'm about to die, God will surely come to your aid and take you up out of this land to the land he promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Joseph made the Israelites swear on oath and said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up from this place. Okay, so Joseph is dying again, and he's he's again speaking something for the future. He's sure that God's going to bring something to pass, that God will bring the Israelites out of Egypt. It's going to happen. And he has, he has this strong faith on his deathbed as well as his father and his father's father. They're all exhibiting this strong trust in God's promises to come through. And so what's, what, this, I wrote this down, I think it's funny. I think he, he says, when, when God does this, because he will do it, take my bones with you. I want out of this stinking desert. <laughs> So what's the pattern? Do you guys see a pattern here? What's the common denominator? I think it's this. What you have here in all three instances is men on their deathbed 
reassuring their kids that God's promises will soon be fulfilled. That's, I think that's the common denominator in those three verses, is that on their deathbed, each of these men exhibits strong faith in God's promises in the midst of dying, in the midst of dire circumstances, and in the presence of their children. And each kid saw his father on his deathbed, trusting anyway. They saw that no matter what the circumstances, my dad really believes this. And I think it was in those moments that the kids saw that their, fa- their parents' faith was real. It was in those moments that I think that the kids really made their faith their own. Um, and, and, and then it passed on to them. And then they'll pass it on to their kids. Th- that's when those guys grabbed a hold of it and, and began believing with real, vibrant faith. So... Do you exhibit that kind of faith for your kids? When, when things get tough, the best thing you can do for your children is show them that you continue to trust God. That's when it'll become real for them. That's when the light bulb will go on. Ding, wow, this isn't some show that dad's playing. This isn't some game that mom's playing. This is real, tangible, graspable Faith, it's the thing that sustains them in the midst of of deep, dark moments and trials. And I think that is when kids realize that faith is real and I should make this my own. That is when they see you having solid faith, they will follow suit and have solid faith of their own. Um, your faith truly does affect your family's future. So, we know then that all of us in this room, whether you're a parent or a grandparent or a great-grandparent or you're a future parent or you're a, a spiritual parent, you don't have your own kids but you mentor kids or you teach Sunday school, all of us realize then that our faith impacts generations and generations and generations of people after us if we exhibit this type of solid, real faith. And I think that that is so important for each of us to realize that your faith isn't just in a bubble, in a box. It's not like, it's just my thing. No, no, no. Your faith could potentially affect hundreds and thousands of people in the years to come. If you stand strong If you go through this, your kids will see you go through it. They'll grab a hold of your your faith, make it their own, and then their kids will grab a hold of their faith and make it their own, and their kids, and all of that stuff is reaching out like salt and light into the world. So you could potentially, your faith could potentially affect not only your family, but many other families uh, to come. So let's think about then how we can be people of faith, how we can be fathers and mothers and grandparents of faith. And we're going to try to apply some of the things then uh, that we looked at here. Um, and we're going to talk about three things. Apply these three things to your life so that you can be a father of faith, a mother of faith, a grandfather, a grandmother of faith. Here are three things that I think we can, we can pull out of this text. Number one, not perfect parents, but faith-filled parents. Not perfect parents, but faith-filled parents. The men in these stories are not perfect men. If you read their lives in Genesis, man, they are fatally flawed people. Like, they are horrible. They're wretched, okay, honestly. I mean, think about it. Jacob lied to his blind, dying dad. Like, that's messed up, okay? So these people were not perfect. Now, Uh, Raise your hand. Are you perfect? Anyone? No one raise your hand. Good. Raise your hand if you're not perfect. Great. So parents in this room that aren't perfect, raise your hand. Grandparents in this room aren't perfect, raise your hand. Anyone in this room not perfect, raise your hand. Great. We are fundamentally flawed. We are fallen, sinful people. Good news, though, is that God, by his grace, Jesus redeems us if we trust in him, and he's able to take a fatally flawed person and, and use him for God's glory and redeem the situation, redeem the person. So that's good news. And 
what I'm saying is this. All of us are flawed. You as a parent are flawed. You will fail your kids. They're going to see you get angry. They're going to see you lie. They're going to see you be angry. They're going to see you be wasteful. Uh, They're going to see you mistreat your spouse. You're going to fail your kids. It's going to happen. The thing is, when it happens, you need to demonstrate to your kids what it looks like to be a Christian. Okay? Not perfect parents, faith-filled parents. When you fail, you need to demonstrate what it looks like to be a Christian. Repent. Show your kids what repentance looks like. Model it for them. Apologize when you fail. If your kids have never seen you apologize, if you've never apologized to your kids, something's wrong, okay? Like, when you mess up, your kids need to know that you messed up. They need to know that if, if you don't apologize to your kids when you fail, like, they're going to look at you, go to church, and be like, Dad goes to church on Sundays, Mom goes to church on Sundays, and they put on this act, and then they come home and treat me like junk, and, then, uh, and then, then they just, like, act like nothing's wrong. No, something is wrong, and you need to own up and take responsibility for it and apologize to your children. And, and when you do that, they'll go, oh, wow, Dad's human, and I forgive you. And so I, I just encourage kids in this room, write this down. Poke your parents. Hey, Alex said you should apologize to us. And, and, and they're right, and you should. But you guys, you don't have to be a superhero. Be real, that's all. You don't have to be a superhero. You just have to be godly. Your kids should see in you that you don't have it all together, but that you're leaning on the God who does. Amen? Okay, so model faithfulness to your kids. Show them what it means to be an imperfect person of faith. Secondly, from this text, I think we can pull out that we need to be praying parents. Uh, Everyone except for Joseph in, in the stories, prayed for, blessed their kids. I, I'm assuming Joseph did. He's a pretty spotless guy. Um, but all of the guys, they're praying for not only their children, but they're praying for their grandchildren, and they're actually praying for future generations of their descendants. They're asking for God's blessings to come upon them. They're asking that God would do big things in them and through them. Uh, They're asking God on behalf of their kids. And as parents or grandparents or spiritual parents, we need to be praying for our children as well. And I would say daily. We should be daily praying for our children. Make a prayer list. It's really easy. You get a piece of paper and a pen and you think of things that you should pray for for your kids. Okay, And you write it down or you type it up, print it out, keep it next to your bed or uh, on the fridge or on the breakfast table. And you, you, every day, you pray either through that list or you pick one thing on that list and pray for that, that day. But we should be praying daily for our kids and our grandkids. Um, and here are some things that I think you could include on a list like that. I'm sure you could think of many more. I don't know all of your circumstances, but you could pray for your children's health. You could pray for their salvation. You could pray for their sanctification. Pray for their future education. A lot of Asians here. You could pray for their future spouse. Pray for sexual purity. Pray for protection from evil. Pray for a stronger walk with Jesus. Pray for their future service of the Lord. I don't add to that, but go home and make a list and start praying for your children and grandchildren. And if you don't have kids, pray for your nieces and nephews. Pray for the kids of this church. If you're expecting kids, congratulations, and you should be praying for them. Uh, I, I, uh, I have a friend who um, is he and his wife were expecting, and I said, hey, hey, have you guys started praying for your baby yet? Oh, no, not yet. Well, you should. You should. You really should. I mean, just it's easy. Before you go to bed, grab their hand, say, God, please be with this baby. Form this baby. Make it healthy. Make it strong. Pray for that baby's future salvation. Pray for that baby's future service to the Lord. I mean, start praying for your kids when they're just a few cells, okay? So important. And I think the same thing, too, is for parents who have kids who have grown and have, have 
walked away from the Lord, you should definitely be praying for them. It's never too late. It's never too, they've never walked too far from the Lord for the Lord to uh, snatch them back. If you think of the Apostle Paul, man, he was killing people, okay? So he's killing Christians, and God got a hold of him. So don't stop praying for your children if they've walked away from the Lord. Pray for your children. Pray for whatever circumstance you're in. Be, be a praying parent. Be praying parents. And then finally... I think the third thing we can really pull from this text, and I think this is the big one, is to be legacy-leaving parents. To be legacy-leaving parents. Like I said, if you notice in the story, the true faith of the fathers caught the kids' attention, and those kids made that faith their own, and then their kids made that faith their own. You want to be a person who leaves a legacy. You want your kids to see your faith and follow after it and become amazing godly people and raise amazing godly grandkids who will raise amazing godly great-grandkids and great-grandkids. The Bible actually talks about children like uh, um, arrows in the quill of an archer. Okay, you want to you wanna sharpen your arrows, your kids, into these super poignant weapons and just shoot them out into the kingdom of God and start doing damage against the enemy with your children, right? That's, okay, and that's the idea of leaving a legacy of faith is that you need to show your kids what it means to be a Christian, to have true, real faith, and hopefully they'll grasp that and make it their own. Now, that doesn't always happen. We, I know many people who are awesome Christians and their, their kids aren't walking with the Lord. Maybe some of you in this room, you, you brought them to church, you thought you, you're trying to do everything right, but they're, they're not walking with the Lord. It's not an automatic, guaranteed thing. But, as the Barnapole indicated, parents who took God's word on life and family at face value and applied those words faithfully and consistently had kids who took God's word at faith value and face value and applied it faithfully and consistently. So, friends in this room, it is your responsibility to pass on a legacy of faith to your children and your grandchildren. It's, it's on you. It's your responsibility. And the Bible clearly teaches this, okay? I'm not making this up. The Bible teaches that it's the job of the parents to raise the kids in the ways of the Lord. It's not the youth pastor's job. It's not the children program's job. It's not the godparent's job. It's the parent's job. It's the parent's job to teach the kids the faith. Flip over, if you will, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy is the fifth book of the Bible, so you'll go all the way to the beginning. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy 6. We're going to read verses 1 and 2. And six through nine. Okay, this is what it says. These are the commands, decrees, and laws of the Lord your God that he directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you may enjoy long life. Verse 6, These commandments that I give to you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of the houses on your gates and on your gates. In other words, teach the kids, your kids, God's word all the time. Cooking macaroni and cheese, teaching them. Walking to the aquarium, teaching them, showing them, using life as a... a looking at life through the filter of God's eyes and showing your kids how to see life that way. So, here are some things I think are helpful, might be helpful to you um, as you try to think about, well, how can... Okay, I I agree, Alex. I really want to to start doing this. I want to be intentional in raising my kids and grandkids in the ways of the Lord. Um, And let me just say, if you've failed at this for 40 years, it's not too late to start now, okay? Start being intentional about uh, training your children and your grandchildren up in the way 
of the Lord. Don't continue in failure just because it's been a past habit. Um, so here are some things, I think. Here are some traditions that you could start with your family to create this, this, this infusion of faith in your family. Here's a good tradition. Tradition number one. Go to church on Sundays. No, I'm serious. Like, I'm, go to church on Sundays. Bring your family. Go to church. Um, I, you need to show your kids that worshiping God on Sundays is important. Okay? They're, everyone's going, oh, I can't. I got a soccer game. I can't. We're going to um, go bowling. I can't. There's a birthday party. Forget the birthday party. We're going to worship God, kids. That's what we're doing. Okay? Show kids that God is worth it, that he's important. Um, the soccer game, sports things, it's all great. But, man, don't let your kids think that church isn't important. I can tell you, I've seen so many young junior high boys grow up in my youth group, and by the time they hit high school, they're out of here. They left. You know why? Because dad doesn't come to church. Dad doesn't go to church. And they're, dad showed them church isn't important. So they're like, I guess church isn't important. So really, honestly, it sounds silly, but tradition number one, go to church with your families. Show them the importance of worshiping with other believers. Um, other traditions that I think uh, are, are good, I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, pray before bed. Pray as a family. I was kind of shocked to learn that like a lot of uh, husbands and wives, even very godly people that I consider to be just really strong Christians, I, re- I found out, oh, they don't pray together before bed. I was like, I thought everybody did that, <laughs> but I guess not. But it's really easy. Like I said, you're laying there, grab their hands, say, hey, let's pray. Let's pray for the day. Let's pray for tomorrow. Let's pray that God would do, you know, whatever circumstances you're in. Pray as a family before you go to bed. That's a really good tradition. Uh, Derek North uh, has a really cool tradition that uh, I got to experience a few weeks ago at Levi, his son's first birthday. Uh, what they do is every first birthday, they uh, have a prayer that Derek and Trisha write out, uh, a prayer of blessing, a prayer of, you know, all sorts of things for, the, for that child. And before they do cake, before they do presents, before they do anything else, they grab the kid in their arms and they pray to the Lord this prayer for that kid. And then they open it up to a season of prayer for all the people who came to the party to pray for that kid. I think that's a really cool tradition and I'm going to steal it. So, <laughs> Thanks. He said it's okay. Um, another thing I think... Uh, well, I, I, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. You can, you can go home and come up with your own traditions, um, but I think that we need to really think about how we're infusing faith into our families. You guys, parents and grandparents, you have the responsibility to start creating your faith legacy right now. It's, it's your responsibility. And uh, for those of you who are grandparents in the room, if your kids aren't believers, then it's your responsibility to to train up the grandkids. And I, there's, there are many amazing examples of people in this church, like the Harrigers um, and, and uh, Clyde and Diana Schaefer and many others who bring their grandkids to church, who teach their grandkids to pray. That's awesome. And this is a golden opportunity for you, grandparents, to reach future generations uh, for many years to come. You know, you, there are or use the few years you have left to literally make an eternal impact in the lives of your children and grandchildren. For those of you who are parents of teens, my profuse apologies. <laughs> it's so hard. No, I'm just kidding. I love the teenagers. They're like my favorite group. So, But parents, you only have a few, few years left to make an impact in your teen's life. Okay? And... You need to be intentional with that time. You need to engage them in difficult topics. I mean, so, seriously, you need to talk about sexual purity with your teens. I, I know it's awkward, but you've got to do it. If you don't do it, the radio and the TV shows will. So, guys, we need to do everything that we can to be like Jacob and Isaac and Joseph and pass our faith down to the kids. We need to do everything we can to leave a legacy of faith. And it is our responsibility then, as we close, to reach future generations 
And it is our faith that will do that. True faith. Faith lived out daily, honestly, diligently. Faith in the good seasons and faith in the bad seasons. Not perfectly, but consistently. Our faith truly affects our family's future. So my my prayer, my encouragement to you, parents, grandparents, godparents, mentor parents, Sunday school teachers, let us pick up the mantle of faith and walk bravely ahead as, as people of strong conviction and faith who model it with honesty and passion and we put it as the first importance in our lives and in the lives of our families, both for God's glory and for the future of our families. Let's pray together as we close. God, we, uh, we want to be people of faith. We want to be parents of faith. We want to train our kids. God, I think of my daughter, and I, I want her to grow up to love you. Would you please draw her to yourself at an early age, help her to n- never walk away from you and walk into all sorts of pain and hurt. I pray that you protect her. I pray that you would cause all of, our, all of us, all of us parents and grandparents and spiritual parents in this room to, to reach out and show the younger generation that our faith is real, that we truly trust you. And I pray, God, that we would be people who uh, just model with modesty and honesty and admitting to our failures and that we would just lead our children well, that we would give them the best possible start in their walk of faith. And so guide us and direct us. Give us wisdom. I pray that you would show each parent and grandparent here how they can apply this to their own personal family. And I ask that you would build us up for your name. In Jesus' name, amen.